Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Schools are always a major focus of the community and a regular topic here on Newsmakers. Over the past week, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, has spoken out in several related school issues. Eight days ago, the NAACP called a community meeting to draw attention to what it sees as the failure of the schools to address the needs of poor students. 12 News anchor Paula Todi covered that meeting. Cincinnati public school system is playing a terrible game with the lives of our children, and thus their future and our future. The words were strong from the podium, the public, even the picket signs. Okay. Among some of the top concerns, the 30% failure rate of third graders, SAT scores below last year's numbers, and a 17% high school dropout rate. Parents say the school board is arrogant. They point to two principals removed without any explanation to the public. We will not take it. The Board of Education has declared a war on our children, and we're prepared to fight back. Some say fighting back means getting priorities straight, putting students before stadiums. I guarantee you, if the children aren't educated to have the jobs to pay for those stadiums 10 years from now, they'll be sitting there empty. Our children Some say change means new leadership, and the MAACP is urging that certain guidelines be met when hiring the next school superintendent. One teacher called for mentors and support from other teachers. Parents got some of the blame, too, but also a public that many see as indifferent. A greater tragedy is that we have allowed this to happen. Last Tuesday, the NAACP announced that it intends to reopen the school desegregation settlement in the Bronson suit. The NAACP's lawyer, William Taylor, spoke to the issue. Our particular concern uh, has to do with... Uh, eight schools that were originally called low-achieving schools now are called coalition schools. They're schools where, which are overwhelmingly poor. Uh, most of the children are on free and reduced price lunch, and they are racially isolated. They're schools consisting uh, largely of African-American uh, students. One of the schools mentioned in the suit is Rothenberg Elementary. The NAACP charges achievement scores for students at Rothenberg have dropped drastically since 1995. They say 60 percent of first grade students at Rothenberg are reading at, gr at grade level. But the time those same students are in the fifth grade, only 24 percent are reading at grade level. They also report that none of the students at Rothenberg passed all four parts of the sixth grade proficiency test. The other schools listed in the suit are Hayes, Heberly, Heinhold, Hoffman, Euler, Washington Park, and Windsor. To discuss the NAACP's position on the schools, I am joined this morning by Marion Spencer. Marion is a life member and past president of the NAACP. She is also a former member of the Cincinnati City Council. Marion, welcome to Newsmakers. Good morning, Dan. From your perspective, uh, from the NAACP's NAACP's perspective, and I might mention that Milton Hinton is out of town today, and you're ably sitting in. Um, what is the major concern here? Why reopen the Bronson suit at this point? Dan, you uh, probably remember that the first suit filed against the Board of Education was in 1974. I chaired the Education Committee for the branch at that time. We had plaintiffs from the community, parents of students in the school system, biracial, who were concerned that we were not uh, acceding to the 1954 school desegregation uh, de decision. We had not moved fast enough. Well, when we filed that suit uh, in 74, it was because uh, we uh, had not on the board um, positive numbers of uh, representatives who saw that as a problem. From 74 until 84, citizens worked and the, the suit was, we, we were working with that suit. That's a period of 10 years. Uh, in 84, there was a, an agreement. It was called the Bronson suit because Mr. Bronson had his daughter in the school system. There was an agreement that uh, we would go forward w under certain stipulations. In 84, in 94, we amended that agreement. I'm saying this to you so that 
the public will understand this was not a Johnny come lately operation. It's been going on now for 24 years. Mm -hmm. We have been involved with two generations of students in this system. Well, given that, given the length, is the issue in 1998 still the same as the issue in 1974? The concerns that children are not being educated are just as, as critical today as they were in 74, in my opinion. I think in a functioning democracy, we count on the public schools being the place in which the masses of our students are educated. This is not happening in Cincinnati. When we look at these major eight schools that were finally left uh, in the suit because they were the most, in the area of the lowest achievers in the total system, they still are. So the question of achievement and the failure to bring achievement up in these eight schools is the issue in your mind and therefore warrants reopening the suit? It warrants reopening the suit because we are losing students. I would think that the business community would be just as interested as we in this, con in this problem because uh, they do not have the student coming out who can meet their requirements in, in terms of their jobs. And I, I think if we are, we are uh, not making our students competitive in this highly technological world of ours today, we're not doing in the common schools our job. You know, uh, I invited someone from the school system to be here today, and there were conflicts in schedule. But John Concanon, I interviewed him the other day. He commented about whether this was uh, the right grounds on which to reopen the suit. And I'd like to play a bit of that interview, let, him, let you hear what he has to say, and then see what your reaction is. Concern over performance is legitimate, but it's not a legitimate basis for reopening the suit. Achievement is the number one concern. That is absolutely paramount with the district. But I do not want to confuse our concern over achievement with our obligations under the Bronson case. That agreement does not include results. It does not include, we must meet this goal. We must do that. We must get achievement here. By agreement of the parties, what we did is we came up with numerous strategies, things we thought together would improve achievement, our best guesses, and frankly, some pretty good things. We did some things like we agreed to appoint a full-time preschool administrator. Very clear. It didn't say the administrator must accomplish this. None of that. We did things like agree that we would put in these plus programs to do away with social promotion, which we agreed was not something we wanted to have happen. We also agreed that we would uh, increase parental involvement. And we talked about steps we'd take with that. Some of these things were district-wide. Other things started in these eight schools. Other things started in other schools. So to say that section two of the agreement, improving education, centers only on the eight CIS schools is just not true. Marion, what's your reaction to that? I think we change the ground rules uh, every time we find our, position, our particular ox being gored. I think that children are in schools to be educated. If they're not being educated, uh, preferably in racially inclusive settings, they're not being educated to function in a highly functioning democracy. So, but I, I think the question from Kincannon's point of view is that that may be true. The question of achievement is something to be talked about. I think what he's saying is that the Bronson suit isn't the tool to get at that, though, that reopening the Bronson suit at this moment isn't the best way to get at these questions of achievement. I don't think the system is ever ready for a, a challenge. Uh, I, I say that because uh, we have one board member who has been on board from the beginning of these debates. Uh, that uh, board and, and that who's that board member? That's Virginia Griffin. Right. Uh, that uh, board member's position has been recalcitrant. Those new people coming in, and each time you get a new group, there is always a need to re-educate, uh, have to deal with what is. 
They do not uh, have to deal with what has not been done in the past. They deal with what is. And I can understand the frustration of an art hall, for example, as board president. Uh, but I do feel that they all are basically interested in how children are being educated in a public school system. The NAACP position was quality, integrated education. It has not changed. We believe that uh, the best way to educate in, uh, for a functioning democracy is in a qualitative, integrated uh, situation. Let me raise this question. Why now? Why at this moment bring this issue back up? Why reopen the Bronson suit at Mr. this moment? Mr. Concannon knows that the time for re-looking uh, at it was about to run out. It's a matter of timing. It's a matter of, uh, of concern for that which has not been done. And the great uh, uh, recalcitrance which we have met at the board level in making these changes. I'd like to play one more clip of the tape of my interview with Mr. Concannon speaking to that same point about timing. Let's listen to that. The state superintendent is not finished with his assessment. Okay? The state superintendent has received a lot of information from us over a period of time. At the request of the plaintiffs, the state superintendent then asked for more information and, and got into more of an evaluation. Um, that, is, that has to be completed. The state superintendent then makes recommend, or, uh, does an assessment and makes recommendations. That is the last piece of this agreement. That completes every term of this agreement. That's all that's left for the plaintiffs to hang on to. We heard from the State Department that their, their assessment and recommendations are um, anticipated within six weeks. Is that it? As, as time's late, running out? As late as March of this year, uh, the state superintendent's office had not received from the Cincinnati Public School System information which it had requested. Uh, we have that in our own files. I think that there has not been timely uh, uh, accommodations of their requests. Let me, let me raise another aspect of the timing question, and this is my observation, not Mr. Kincannon's. I didn't talk to him about this at all. At all. And that is, going along on another track, is the process for selecting a new superintendent with Michael Brandt's resignation. Is this, and the meeting several weeks ago, the public meeting several weeks ago that the NAACP called, seemed to me had much more to do with that than it did with the Bronson suit. Is that also a reason to reopen the Bronson suit at this moment and basically try to uh, get the NAACP into a position to have some greater influence on the selection of the next superintendent. I think the occurrence of the two things is simply um, coincidental. Uh, the uh, timing of the Bronson suit, as I say, was about to run out. We would have lost our opportunity for uh, asking the federal uh, courts to take a second look at what had not been done here. Uh, I think the superintendency is uh, operating on its own. It's a very long-term concern that many of us have had as to um, the capability of the current superintendent. Uh, Michael Brandt came in uh, not really equipped for the job. And I think this is where what we... What, was, what, was, what did he lack? And what well, would you like to see in the next superintendent? I, I, th I think uh, an educational uh, background, a strong educational background, is extremely important. He came in with business support, but that did not mean he... But he had also been a lifelong a teacher, administrator, a school principal, uh, right? The, the schools in which he had, a, had been an administrator had not done that well. I think that that had a lot to do with his ability to administer on a, a district-wide basis. Uh, that he is leaving with a very nice stipend, uh, I, I, I question. But that I'm glad that he is going because I think we have long since needed a different person at that level and a stronger person at that level. Uh, the changes that have occurred in the system have been majorly uh, negative. They have not addressed the concerns that we had with the Bronson suit early on. Uh, the system is getting more and more segregated in terms of racial, uh, uh, of the, the look of the system racially, 
and academically we have these eight schools that we are pointing to that were supposed to have made progress and they have not they're not even meeting uh, prof proficiency tests at any level concretely what do you what do you want to have changed um, let me lay a couple of things out as in the last 24 years the racial balance inside the city of Cincinnati school system uh, has become overwhelmingly African-American and it's harder and harder to get those mixes uh, in the schools and secondly do you want specifically an African-American superintendent is that what the NAACP is asking for the uh, NAACP individually I think uh, there are people who think it would help to have uh, uh, a Lionel Brown, for example, in the role who was qualified uh, for state for this uh, superintendency when Mr. Brandt was selected. But I think because he now is working with uh, the special problem children uh, in Project Succeed, what we really need is a, a person with ability, and I don't think it has to do with color. I think that it has to do with uh, sensitivity to the problems of the total district. Now, you know, we're looking at a city in which um, residency is no longer required for police or fire or teachers. We're looking at a city that um, uh, is holding meetings on regionalism, uh, but we're also looking at a city that in 74 was not able to go beyond its boundaries to have a quality integrated school system. Uh, we, we need a metropolitan look at our system. And I don't think we can do it within the boundaries of the district. We're almost out of time. Yes. Half a minute here. Is that what you really want, is to open up this issue so that the question of integration of schools is not just a city of Cincinnati school system question, but maybe a countywide question, integration on a countywide regional basis? Dan, let me ask you, if your child at the fifth grade was doing less well than he was at the first or second grade, wouldn't you want to do something about it? it but is that what you That's, want to do? We're looking at competitive education and whatever media uh, is required to make that exist, we would look to, to establish. Well, thank you very much and thank you for your frankness. Thank so. you. We love to talk about regionalism. It just came up here and bridging the gap between Ohio and Kentucky. Stay tuned. After the break, we will take a look at some concrete action to tie the region together at the street level. Welcome back. South Bank Partners is an organization founded in 1997 and to develop the Northern Kentucky Riverfront. One very visible result of this partnership's effort will make its appearance this Tuesday on May the 6th to talk about the, partner to talk about the partnership and its goals. I am joined by two of its members. Laura Long is the Economic Development Director for the City of Newport, a city that is certainly staking a claim to not only leading the way in Northern Kentucky but in the entire region and Dan Lincoln, a vice president with the Greater Cincinnati Chamber, of, or not Chamber of Commerce, but Convention and Visitors Bureau. Very good. Welcome to Newsmakers. And Laura, in your case, welcome back. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Laura, first off, before we get right into the shuttle, yes. tell me a little bit more about South Bank Partners and what it consists of. And obviously, with Dan here, it's not just people in Northern Kentucky. That's correct. It's actually um, it's a, a partnership <laughs> effort with the business community. Um, and the cities, Bellevue, Covington, and Newport, working and interacting with the city of Cincinnati to really bring 
the forefront of our urban core together and really market it as a great attraction. Okay. So concentrating on both sides of the river and and trying to make sure that we see that, that when we say that when you say the core, you mean the downtowns yes. of Cincinnati, Covington, Newport, and Bellevue. That's correct. Okay, that whole broad basin right. area. Uh, Dan, something this week, uh, pretty exciting. Tell me about the shuttle. What what exactly is is that, and what do you hope to accomplish by it? Well, the shuttle. Uh, kicks off next Wednesday, May 6th. And I think I said Tuesday. Yeah, but that's so right. It's Wednesday. Uh, it's actually kind of exciting because it's part of National Tourism Week uh, around the country. Uh, we as a community in a region are going to celebrate that on Fountain Square on Wednesday uh, at noontime. And we're going to kick off the uh, new South Bank shuttle, which will be a, a series of eight shuttle buses that are going to go both clockwise and counterclockwise, a circuitous route through Bellevue, uh, and Covington and Newport and downtown Cincinnati connecting all the hotels, restaurants, entertainment districts, helping people to get back and forth between the two rivers. Uh, I think we have a map that we can put up of that route, but Laura, what do you hope? Who do you hope rides this, uh, these shuttles? Well, our first objective of what we're trying to do bo on both sides of the river is really cultivate our internal market, the workers and the people who live here before the tourists arrive with the new Bengal Stadium and the Red Stadium, the Aquarium and the Millennium Monument so that we get the local market understanding how they can use the shuttle system and then it will um, greatly add to decongestion of traffic problems and it'll be so convenient and it's, it really serves as a concrete way that we can work together for the benefit of the region. You know, real practically, and we just had the map up there before, and it will, you will have different vehicles going in different directions. Yes. Right. So there'll be a lot of service That's right. Uh, right. At, from any one point. And fun. what's it going to cost? 25 cents. Sounds like a good deal to me. And or a token. Or a token. You can get your, your little token at restaurants and you hold that uh, hotels right. all along the route. And uh, drop this in, and 25 cents, very inexpensive and you can ride the shuttle the whole route. Uh, you can get on and off wherever you'd like. Uh, it's very cheap, very easy. The shuttle will actually, from Sunday through Thursday, will hit each stop every 20 minutes. On Friday and Saturday, it's going to hit every stop every 15 minutes. And it runs, during the week, it will run from 10 to 10, and on the weekends, obviously, it'll extend and go till one in the morning. So. Very convenient. Uh, it's very easy to get on and off. There will be signs at the shuttle stops that'll say where it's going. So you, when you get on, uh, you'll know exactly where you're going and and how long it'll take you to get there. So this is user friendly. Very. Very, and it's handicapped accessible. The buses, the shuttles are, and it's great for strollers. Um, so it's going to be a real asset for our entire region. Well, you know, as things are developing on the riverfront, yes. especially right in your city with the mm -hmm. aquarium uh, and I, I has the IMAX actually been announced? announced? Not officially. Not officially but <laughs> we're all expecting it let's put it that way okay? We're working towards that end. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is there but but the aquarium is well underway. Yes. Uh, we'll under construction. What's the opening date for that? In May of next year. Okay so there will be reason uh, mm -hmm. for families, for people mm -hmm. with strollers perhaps, to yes. be visiting the aquarium and then looking for a restaurant mm -hmm. and going back and forth. Yes, and the, and the beauty of this is how we can connect actually when the visitor comes to town, they can park in any of the garages in downtown Cincinnati, in Covington or Newport, and they leave their car. Mm -hmm. They don't have to get back in their automobile. They take this shuttle, which will conveniently take them to all the points of destination on the route. That's right. So, that's it, the beauty of it. Yeah, we have about four and a half million visitors a year. Most people in Cincinnati area don't think of us as a tourism destination, but we very much are, especially weekend getaways. They're coming in for the Reds and Kings Island and, and things we take for granted like the museum, the arts, the hills, the river. And when those tourists come in and conventioneers, they don't see two states, they don't see multiple cities. They just know if I'm staying here and I want to go to the aquarium, I want to go to the Millennium Tower, I want to go to Museum Center, uh, it's all one greater Cincinnati area. So the shuttle goes a long way to closing that gap for our customer. Very practically, um, in the fall of 99, 
for tall stacks. This will be operating, right? That's an Absolutely. excellent example. Where I, I myself have been on one side of the river and wanted right. to get back to the other right. in right. a rainstorm and had to walk across. Exactly. It. As somebody who grew up in northern Kentucky, I, I think the joke used to be that that was a very wide river. Are there other things uh, in the works by the South Bank partners to help bridge that river and overcome this psychological break between the two communities? Yes, long term, you know, when we look at the LNN bridge, we'd like to create that as a pedestrian walkway so we can connect Cincinnati's venues on their riverfront with um, activities on our riverfront. And that way you can, again, park in the parking garage and you can walk across the bridge and we can have this. Uh, co-mingling uh, take place that we've never been able to do before. Well, we're out of time. Good luck on Wednesday and good luck with the shuttle and other projects. Thank Thanks you, for Dan. being here. Thank you. And thank you for making Newsmakers part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next Sunday and meet the men and the women who are shaping our community for the future.